Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. This is episode 151, and I'm your host, Dave Hartman. My guest this week is Team Bushmaster and Thurian Defense shooter, Rob Tate. We discuss Rob's transition from high-level pistol shooter into three-gun and what those first years were like. Before we get into the interview, a couple things. I've mentioned a few times I started a Patreon account for the show. Patreon is a service that allows you as an individual to support me as a creator monetarily with out the need for an intermediary like a network or something like that. You can think of it as crowdsourcing, crowdfunding on a subscription subscription basis. If you choose to support the show using Patreon, there are multiple levels, for example, $1, $2, $5 per month and on up, each with their own reward. And you can see those rewards at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. One of those levels is a private Facebook group. Another gets you access to uh, match recon podcasts and other bonus content. And uh, there are other, other great rewards at um, at each level. So the match recon podcasts uh, that I mentioned are available through Patreon exclusively for the first 90 days for supporters of the three gun show. And there are many of them out there as well. If you choose to support the show using Patreon, you can do so patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash three gun show. Now on to uh, this week's podcast. Uh, I've wanted to have Rob on for quite some time now, and uh, I'm pumped that we got we caught up with each other at the, uh, the Lucas Oil PCC World Championship, which which was a really fun match. Um, we cover a lot of actionable topics, including stage breakdown, mental game, and the low hanging fruit to improve your game. And uh, of course, we talk some PCC as well. Show notes can be found at threegunshow.com slash episode 151. Now enjoy this one with Rob Tate. Rob, welcome to the Three Gun Show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time. We've talked about it several times, and now we've finally got time to sit down. I know. This is great, dude. And uh, so I accidentally shot this uh, this match that we're at here, so it's it's kind of funny how <laughs> life works, and uh, we've got some extra time in, in the afternoon here. We're in the middle of uh, some beautiful trees, some brand new picnic tables. we got the Coca-Cola truck icing down some uh, Coca-Cola next to us. Humming in the background. Humming in the background. That one's free Coke. you got to pay for next time. But... <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's set the stage rob we're we're at the lucas oil pcc world championship yes we are and and if i could ask you a question so yeah how, how do you accidentally shoot a match <laughs> well so i was um i was over at rock house of pro am mm-hmm. and i was shooting that match uh i got, actually let me uh let me back up a little bit before that i was at the uh the wyoming governor's match in uh in cheyenne sure and uh lisa marie judy was there and uh, we were we were chatting about it, and she's like, "Why aren't you shooting the PCC thing?" I'm like, well, "I don't have PCC, blah 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 blah. My ammo budget, my travel budget's all figured out, and everything." So, and and it's the truth, right? Yeah, my sure. my budget, just like anyone's, is is set out at the beginning of the year. And uh, and she's like, "Oh well, you know, you know, you know, you can borrow a a rifle from anyone." I'm like, "Yeah, it's probably true, but you know, then there's still the travel and ammo and stuff." So. I was at Pro Am and I was talking to Chad Francis, right? Fast forward, Pro Am. Yeah. I'm talking to Chad Francis and I'm like, hey man, uh, I got about a week to um, lay over between shooting the Jeff Kirkwood Memorial match in Minnesota and your match, which is the Generation Three Gun match in uh, in Missouri. Um, is it cool if I stay at your range? You offered this to me a while back and want to make sure it's still cool. And he's like, well, yeah, but why aren't you shooting the PCC championship? I'm like, well, you know, travel and all this. He's like, travel? It's 40 minutes from where yeah. Gen 3 is going to be. Gen 3 next week, yeah. Yeah, so once I once I found that out, I was like, well, shoot, I'm almost out of excuses here. So, <laughs> Well, you should have called me. You needed a rifle. Yeah, I, I guess I should have. But it's uh, it's funny when when you're in this sport, mm-hmm. right, and, and you know this as well as anyone, and I was just up in Minnesota. I kind of started saying, well, you know, I think I might head down to the PCC World Championship. And all of a sudden, you know, Ruben's like, here, you can use mine. And, and uh, Todd Overland's like, here, you can use mine. And then, Sazen, like, four other yeah. people. Yeah, Sazen. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so Todd Overland lent me his uh, JP GMR-15 and uh, had a little cool Vortex Razor Red Dot on yeah. top of it. And uh, came down here with uh, 500 
rounds of ammunition in tow. Shot the match, and you saw I've got like seven rounds of ammunition left. It was a good match so far. Good. good. Yeah. And you're out here shooting too. So I yep. shot, this is kind of an interesting match. So you could shoot it all Friday, mm -hmm. or you could do like a split uh, Saturday-Sunday match. That is true. AM, PM format. Yeah, and so you're shooting Saturday, Sunday here. Yeah, I always try to shoot the half day format. Um, I think it gives you uh, it's it's all mental, right? I, and I'm sure we'll talk about it as the show goes on. And the majority of this sport is mental, um, but to to be turned on, if you will, um, for an entire day shooting ten yeah. stages and and God knows what weather, right? So when you sign up, you don't know if it's going to be a hurricane <laughs> yeah. uh, or if it's going to be, you know, beautiful like it is now or if it's going to be 110 degrees with no air moving. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to break that up into two half-day formats uh, or two half days, um, five stages a day, it, it it allows you to rest in between. So we shot four sta or five stages, excuse me, this morning. Uh, we were done by, I think, noon. Mm -hmm. um, it gives me all day today, all evening. Um, then we don't come back to the range until 1230 tomorrow. Yeah. So it gives us plenty of time to rest and then shoot the second half of the match. The other side of that is, um, like I said, with the weather, you know, it, if you show up and shoot all day Friday, and Friday's a terrible day of weather, you're, you shoot the whole match in terrible weather. Yep. Um, it, if you do the half-day format, you got two days. It could be bad one day. could be nice the next. It's, mm -hmm. it's all a gamble. Um, but I try to stick to the two half day formats if possible. Yeah. Okay. So we've uh, we've discussed this on the uh, the show a lot before. Um, half day versus like an on off format. What's your what's your take on that? Oh, half day for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, if you shoot an all day format, I'm assuming you're talking like uh, Rock Castle used to be. Yes. Uh, for all their matches, yeah. they schedule your break in between each stage. Yeah. So you've got like 90 minutes in between or yeah, two hours. So. <sighs> For a PCC match like this, it wouldn't be that bad. But if you do that for a three-gun match, you know you got 12 to 14 people on a three-gun state or mm -hmm. a squad, um, and so it's it's about an hour and a half per squad, you know, per stage, mm -hmm. um, and then they schedule they schedule an hour and a half in between, so it's literally like three hours between the times that you pull trigger. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. so it's in essence, it's like every stage is your first stage of the day. Yes. Um, and like the, the old days at, at rock castle, um, you know, you would shoot three stages and you would be on the range for nine hours mm -hmm. and, and nine hours to shoot, you know, a hundred seconds, 150 seconds. It, it, it was really tiring. Um, I definitely prefer the half day. You yeah. can come, you, you turn, you switch yourself on. You shoot for four hours. You go from stage to stage to stage, and then and then you're done. To you can turn it off and relax, and yeah. and you know, fix gear if you need to, work on things, clean magazines, clean guns, do whatever you need to do to to get, get ready for the next day. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've found in shooting like the on-off format is kind of like what you're saying is switching yourself on. Like I find that there's just enough time for me to have my adrenaline dump mm -hmm. after being on that stage and to decompress, and maybe now I'll sit down in a lawn chair. And it's it's getting to the point where it's like almost nap time, you know, after the, uh, sure. you know, after you, you you make the kill and you you know you barbecue the meat, yep. you're full, and now you go time for you know, food induced yeah, it's, coma. Exactly, it's that fight or flight sort of thing, yeah. you know, where you get that um, that heightened response, and now it's over. Right. So you got to go down, and yep. now you got to get yourself back up again for the uh, the next uh, stage. And so, for me, I find my, myself thinking like. Oh, maybe I'll you know snag a cup of coffee or a rock star or something. So now you're talking about like introducing, yep. um, you know, chemicals into your Caffeine, bloodstream that you normally yeah, wouldn't do. Exactly, exactly. You don't keep things balanced. You know, most of the guys that, that shoot at the top of the game, they have a regimen of some kind. You know, most of us will eat, you know, a granola bar or something, or maybe drink a monster or a juice or a soda or something in between stages. There's, you know, a couple of waters in between stages. Make sure you stay hydrated throughout the day. Um, and to keep energy in you, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is you know, is come to the last stage of the day and just feel drained. You know, yeah. your, your your vision gets, you know, impaired. You know, every, that's the first thing to go whenever yeah. your body starts getting dehydrated, you start getting tired, you start losing oxygenation of the blood. You know, it, it, your vision starts to go. And in and, yeah. and the game that we play, it's kind of important. Very important. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you're right. So whenever you, you practice all of your matches, you know, <laughs> For me, um, I'm a strong believer. I do a little bit of range work, um, you know, just going out and setting stuff up and practicing. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout my entire shooting time, um, my number one practice has been local matches. 
okay. because I believe that there there's no better practice than shooting target arrays and stages that were dreamt up by somebody else. Right. Right. Because any of us can go out and set targets up and think about what we want to shoot. You know, and you can become yeah, and really you're good. You're trying to solve your own problem. Yeah, you, you could created. be you could be awesome at f- at shooting your own stage designs. Mm-hmm. You know, but unless you're the match director and you're designing the stages for the match, it doesn't help you a lot. Right. Um, so I like to go and shoot, and I'll shoot. I like to shoot different matches. You know, I don't like to go to the same local club week after week after week and shoot the same. You know, the same match director stages mm-hmm. because it, I, I like to have the you know the variety. Um, and, and each match director has kind of his own flavor to his own match. Um, and once you get to know your local match directors for, um, for local matches, you can actually tune what matches you go to for practice, depending on the major match you're going, if you know who the match yeah, director is there, yeah. because you know, if they have, you know, if they're like minded match directors, mm-hmm. you know, or what kind of flavor their match is exactly. compared to something else. And does it match the, the match record I'm going to go see? Yeah. If I'm going to shoot a match in Tulsa. As an example, USSA, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm going to go shoot local matches that are all base stages, right? I'm not going to go shoot a natural terrain club for my right. practice match because I'm not going to see that at the major. I'm going to see a bunch of base, and it's going to be a bunch of, of footwork and stuff that you see here at Lucas Oil and stuff that you see here at Lucas Oil. So, um, you know, you, you kind of tune that to, to what you're going to see at, at the major matches. Right. Well, so so that's – that's uh you know, higher level concept. Let's let's take it back, mm-hmm. um, all the way. Let why don't you uh, why don't you give the idea or the audience an idea of who you are off the range? Maybe you who you are when you're not shooting. Sure. And then uh, let's use that to uh, get into how you started shooting uh, three gun competitions. Sure. Um, so I, I was I did four years in the Navy. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to that, throughout high school, I shot a lot of competitive archery and I hunted. Um, if we roll way back. Um, to whenever I was a kid, my dad shot Ipsic in the late 70s, oh, no early kidding. 80s. Yeah, he was a match director, um, ran some it's major like matches. Back in the yeah, so early there, days. He's, he actually showed a video uh, last Christmas or Christmas before he drug it out and showed my wife. There's a, a video in 1986, I think it was, 87, of me on a four wheeler running around, <laughs> uh, running score sheets at, at a major USPSA match. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah, that he was a match director at. So, he, he shot USPSA or IPSC at that time. Um, and then whenever I got to the age where I could, you know, start shooting IPSC, he had kind of pulled away from it, you know, whenever the whole arms race was happening and they hadn't split it up into divisions. And it, mm-hmm. So he had backed away from that and we started shooting archery. And uh, I got really big into hunting. I grew up hunting from five years old until I'm still a hunting freak right now. Um, so uh, the competitive archery took me into the Navy. Then uh, I joined the Navy in 95. Uh, the Navy has an archery team? No. Or they have archers. No. So you like sit on the bow of the boat? And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I did. I, I was I was a bow archer. <laughs> I, I was a bow archer on the uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, the nuclear aircraft carrier. That way, you know, if, if there were swimming monkeys or something. We, <laughs> no. Smalley pirates. Yeah. Yeah. Smalley pirates. We sh- <laughs> yeah. Shoot them with long bows. But, Makes sense. Uh, uh, but no, so I shot competitive archery up. I joined, joined the Navy in, in 95. IDPA started mm-hmm. in 96. Um, my dad got back involved with the shooting sports. He switched back from archery over into shooting IDPA, but I was gone for four years. Right. You know, I was, I was in the Navy. Then I got out of the Navy, uh, took a job with Zeiss. Um, I was a, a service engineer at, in the beginning and then ended up running the equipment business for them for the thin film vacuum deposition coating, uh, division. Um, and I spent the first probably four or five years there. I was on the road nonstop. Mm-hmm. I was never home. So I didn't have time to do anything. So all I did is hunt a little bit here and there. Um, I still shot archery whenever I could. Uh, I moved to Richmond, Virginia. Um, couldn't find any archery clubs to shoot at there. Uh, bought a carry pistol. Uh, went to a range. Excuse me. Went to a range there and uh, just to shoot the pistol. The guy says, "Hey, we have action shooting on Monday nights. You, you know, if you're interested, you can come try it out." And, and uh, I went and shot the first night. And uh, as you've mentioned before, you know, the shooting sports, the people are phenomenal. So I shot the first night and they're like, hey, you know, on Saturday we have an outdoor match that's like 30 minutes from here. So I went and shot that and I'm at the outdoor match. And they're like, hey, an hour from here tomorrow we have another IDPA match if, if you want to come shoot that. So I went and shot that one and then it went on and on and on um, to, to where I am here. But uh, 
you know, I started shooting. It was funny because the Monday night action match, um, Ravin Perry and I started shooting that match, that same match, oh, no uh, like a week apart. We didn't know each other at all. Huh. Um, we started shooting, and I thought he was a crazy kid. The first outdoor match <laughs> that, that we were both at, he locked his keys in his Jeep, and he's freaking out. And uh, <laughs> But, it, yeah, it was it was wild because Ravin shot – as fast now as he did then as he does now he just couldn't hit anything then <laughs> so um so it was funny but um you know the group that we shot with there in richmond it's a great shooting community in the richmond area you uh -huh. know we're just north of north carolina you know where it's sir walter and all those i mean there's yeah. there's a lot of great talent in that in that little hub you know um so Started shooting IDPA. Ravin and I were the only two in the group that really started traveling in the beginning to shoot matches. We started traveling together and became. So you guys became, created a friendship then oh, on the range. And yeah, absolutely. And then off the range as well. All right. Um, so, uh, and, and the funny thing is, so we shot IDPA and then we started branching out into USPSA a little bit. Uh, and then people said, hey, you can win money in USPSA. You know, IDPA. It's all random draw. You know, there's no prize for, for order of finish, and, mm -hmm. and which, which isn't a bad concept. But it's like, hey, you know, it's, it's taking it to the next level. We get to shoot more. Uh, so we went and started shooting, shooting USPSA. We shot that for a couple of years. Went and shot nationals a couple of years. Um, enjoyed that for a while. Um, and then Larry Houck is actually to blame <laughs> uh, for us shooting three-gun. Uh, we went and shot one three-gun match, ran into Larry. Larry says, hey, you guys need to come shoot FNH. I said, well, when is it? He goes, oh, well, whatever the weekend was. I said, I can't. He said, well, I said, that's the same weekend as IDPA Nationals. He's like, ah, don't worry about IDPA Nationals. I was like, well, I'm, an, <laughs> I'm like, I'm an area coordinator for, no, for one, and it's an hour and a half from my house. Number two, you know, I kind of got to go. He goes, well, come shoot the match with my staff on Wednesday. So I looked at Ravin, and he's like, yeah, why not? So we went and we shot it. Uh, Shot the whole thing in one day. It was funny because Greg Jordan at that point was an up and comer, you mm -hmm. know, and nobody really knew the name yet. Mm -hmm. um, so him and Jason so Smith. So we're Tate and Ravin Perry, right? Absolutely. So, uh, so Jason Smith and Greg Jordan, you know, they they come out and Larry put them in a razor and said, "Hey, I want you to take these two guys, take them to every stage that's open, and get them shot through the match today." Oh, you're kidding. So it was nine stages. So we walked up. We got the stage brief on each stage. And then we took turns going first. And it was just the two of us resetting for each other and the two of them helping us reset. And we shot the whole match in one day. Oh, how nine, cool is that? It was nine stages. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, shoot, <laughs> shooting a three-gun match all in one day is, is quite a bit. But. Well, And there's only two of you. And you yeah. know nothing about three-gun, mind you. This is our first major three-gun match. Right. So First ever. So d describe that experience then, like, you know, knowing what you know now, what were some things that you were doing wrong? Oh, my God. Uh, the list would be much shorter if I told you what we were doing right. <laughs> the pistol? Um, yeah, the pistol. We shoot shot the well. Pistol, right? we, shot, we shot the pistol really well. <laughs> it was like, so I can shoot my shotgun or I can shoot my pistol. They're like, yeah. I'm like, all right, I'm leaving the shotgun in the truck. Um, <laughs> no, no. So, I mean, we had put some gear together because we wanted to start shooting because there was a, uh, there was a bunch of local matches starting. You know, mm -hmm. Tar Heel was yeah. two hours down the road mm -hmm. from us. We'd shot a couple of local Tar Heel matches. It's a leaf. Oh. It's a leaf. Sorry, it's man. Okay. Don't die. Skittish of bugs now. There's no snakes. After that, uh, be in uh, in Minnesota. But or uh, wasp or whatever it was. Yeah. So we so we had the, a little bit of the gear and and whatnot. But man, it was it was terrible. We were shooting. I was shooting a 16 inch M and P 15 with a two to eight scope on it. Oh, nice. Yeah. No side irons. No nothing. I was shooting. Um, I did have a Benelli. Ravin had a Benelli. Uh, when we were shooting our M and P pistols and and you know back then there was no such thing as twins so we were trying to yeah. load fours out of a caddy one at a time yeah, which shuffle is, them under. yeah which is like a masochist thing especially the first time you do it yeah exactly so and and we had nobody to watch shoot the stages we had you know so it, it, we didn't know anything about it right. they're like yeah look this is how I would do it and we knew Jason Smith from shooting pistols he's like this is how I would do it so that's kind of what we did and. Um, the, the funny thing is, and, and that was like the, our segue into three gun because um, we shot that match all day. We left Wednesday night. We drove back to Richmond. Um, we got in the truck Thursday morning. We drove down and shot the IDP and Nationals. I think I was first SSP master or something in, in the Nationals. I think Ravin was first or yeah, probably first ESP um, in the Nationals. And we're, we're sitting at the awards banquet on Saturday night. 
and we go up and you know we get our trophy which is great you know yeah. i still have it, it it's it's memorable it was i think first or second nationals that i ever really won anything um and we're on the phone with somebody that's uh at the banquet for FNH, and mm -hmm. they're like, dude, you finished 25th in TAC Ops. You know, what do you want off the prize table? And I'm like, well, what's there? A bunch of guns. I was like, well, what kind of guns? Dude, there's too many to list. I said, well, just give me whatever's the highest dollar value gun, whatever, right? Uh huh. So I want a $1,500 pistol. Oh, cool. So we're driving home from the Nationals, and <laughs> Vin and I are talking, and I'm like, so same amount of time on the range. We got to shoot three times as much. I finished 25th in the division. And won a fifteen hundred dollar gun. Ravin was in the thirties, I think, in in the division, and won a gun as well. I can't remember what he won. Um, I'm like, you know, for the, the amount of time invested. Yeah. We need the to start, returns pretty yeah, pretty we, big, you know. We need to start playing more three gun, and and that's how we got started into it. It, it uh, and the people in the shooting sports is what keeps you in the shooting yeah. sports. You know, like you said, I started three gun. I didn't know anything about three gun. They're like, look, this is what you need. You need to borrow stuff here. Take stuff. Here's yeah. your shotgun. Take the shotgun. Use it until you, until you get one of your own. You know. Yep. And, and there's great people. I love that about the sport. So it sounds like you'd achieved a high level in IEPA when uh, when you made the transition. Sure. Uh, what, were, did you have like a classification in USPSA? I <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, well, it, USPSA. Uh, well. IDPA, I was, I was a master. We really quit shooting it before the DM started there. Um, we shot USPSA, and it was funny because we shot a classifier match right before we stopped shooting USPSA. Ravin made GM. My classification was like 94.8, something like that. I was a master in production, and but I was like 0 0.2 from GM. Right. And I'm like, I should go shoot one more classifier and bump it over. And and uh Ravin's like what difference does it make he's like it's, yeah. it's a card with a g in front of an m he said it doesn't everybody knows that you can shoot a pistol and i never did and you know looking back over the history of achievements in three gun and in the shooting sports in general that's the one thing that if i look back it was like yeah you should have made one more monthly match you know and i may still do it because it's one of those things in the back of my mind i'm living up in wisconsin now a lot of USPSA yeah. around through the winter. They have not, not you know, indoor matches and yeah. like uh, unfinished business kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. I may go back and see if I can push it over, you know, just over the edge and and make GM. But uh, um, other than that, really no regrets in the, in the history of the shooting sports. It's, That's good. I've, I've enjoyed my my ride. Well, so then you ma you made the transition to three gun, mm -hmm. and traditionally, three gunners like as a whole, mm -hmm. three gunners. Mm -hmm are not that great a pistol right so did you find yeah. <laughs> right yeah so did you find that to be an advantage for you like right right from the start it was a huge advantage um i would recommend it and i have recommended it. anybody that's new to the sport and they ask me you know how how do i get better at this and i tell all of them go find local pistol matches and shoot them mm -hmm. shoot every pistol match that you can get your hand idpa uspsa it doesn't matter if they just have an action-based defensive pistol, whatever is close to you, mm -hmm. that you can go shoot on, you know, on a timer and just with a pistol so you can focus on the gun. Um, well, a lot of people don't know. Um, up until October of 2015, whenever I lived in Virginia, I still, every week, we shot an, I shot an indoor IDPA match every week hmm. from 2007 till 2015. Wow. Every week. If I was not traveling for work, I was at the range and I shot an indoor pistol match. Um, and the reason being is three gun, as it is today, which I I support, the two anywhere with a pistol on, on paper, mm -hmm. it makes it fast, it makes it fun. It's what I like about the sport. But it breeds sloppy pistol shooters. Oh, big time. Yeah, it does. No, so, no side picture, just squeezing in that there's general brown, There's brown in front of the muzzle, pull the trigger, right? Yeah, pretty much. So I would shoot three-gun matches on Saturday and Sunday, and every Tuesday night I would go and shoot IDPA, which is a very accuracy-driven game. Yes. And I would it would force me to keep my pistol shooting in check. Uh -huh. um, did you use the same gear, or did you switch back and forth? I, I used the same pistol. Okay. Um, I used the same magazines. I would just download them to 10 rounds. Oh, okay. Um, and I just used a different belt and holster to make it legal. Um, and a sweet vest. Yeah, sweet vest. <laughs> it's awesome, man. I have a custom vest. Do you really? Oh, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's made out of handkerchiefs or something. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's Is not tie -dye? like. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. Tie <laughs> it's it's tactical khaki, man. You, I got gotcha. you. You don't get any props in in the shooting sports if you don't wear khaki. Totally understand. So. 
<laughs> but uh, but no, and, and I, I I can't say it enough. Um, that if you want to take, I don't care who you are. Mm-hmm. If you want to take your three gun shooting to the next level, focus on your pistol. And why is that? Because it's the hardest gun to master out of all of them. Um, there's a lot to be said with completely mastering a shotgun as well. Yeah. Um, but with a shotgun, it's more about decisions and less about shooting. Mm-hmm. Shotgun, it's what shells do I use? What choke tube do I use? How heavy are the targets? How far away are they? Right. Knowing your gun, your load, your your tube, your barrel, everything combination, right? But shooting a shotgun, let's face it, is not hard. It's it's not hard to hit a target with a shotgun. Right. Um, what's hard is making sure that you have your shotgun configured properly for the stage that you're shooting. Right. And how to load it. Right. right. And practice loading. Um, but other than that, shooting a pistol is is it is the hardest weapon out of the three to actually master. It's the hardest to shoot. Mm-hmm. Shortest sight radius. Shortest easiest sight to radius. Disturb. Easiest to disturb. There's less points of contact with the body. You know, your hands are hovering out there. And and I even tell pistol shooters, you know, that you, if you're going to make the transition into three gun, you have to build your forearm, your grip strength, your shoulder strength, and everything, you know, tighter. Mm-hmm to shoot a pistol in three-gun matches than you do even for pistol matches. Why is that? Well, because if you look at a USPSA match, your longest your longest stage is 32 rounds. Yeah, yeah. Right? 32 rounds. And, and let's face it, even if they have a big stage, you're going to run 25, 30 yards. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Right? It's true. Right? So in a three-gun match, you may have a 150-second stage. Your pistol may be the last thing that you shoot, right. and you may be shooting 35, 40 yard steel, 50 yard steel, 60 year, yard gongs, mm-hmm. whatever, with your pistol after you've shot your rifle long range, after you've ran, after you've shot your rifle, after you've ran some more, after you've got the shotgun beating you to death for 14 rounds or whatever, reloading it. Yeah, and you're holding you up, up those long guns with your left arm guns, spread yeah. straight out. Then you run up the there and you time. grab your pistol. And now after you've done a CrossFit workout, you got to grab your pistol and shoot a gong at 62 yards. You right. never do that in USPSA. Yeah. You know, it, it would be like in a USPSA match. I'm saying, okay, you're going to start 200 yards from the, from the start position. You're going to carry two big sandbags, and you're going to run up the hill to the start position, drop sandbags, and draw your pistol and start shooting. Yeah. You know, so you, you really have to. In three gun, we just go, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> USPSA, yeah. there'd be a mutiny. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and and that's that's some of the differences between pistol shooting and three gun mm-hmm. shooting. You know, three gun, you have to you have to learn to pace yourself. You can't go, you can't sprint the whole time. I mean, some of the younger guys now that you yeah. know, are, it, it, the fitness in this sport is unbelievable. I'm not a, a fitness person <laughs> per se, but uh, the new you know the new kids that are coming into the sport, and I say kids, but they're, you know they're in their twenties. Those are kids. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they are. But, uh, yeah, they can sprint the whole time. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't. I have to pace myself because I know if, if I run, you know, all out for 40 yards and I pick my rifle up and try to shoot a piece of steel at 350 yards, it's not going to work for right. me. If I jog up there and grab the rifle and keep my heart rate under con- under control, my breathing under control, I can make the shot in, mm-hmm. in one or two shots rather than four or five. And mm-hmm. It nets out better in the end, right? Right. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. So um, do you consciously control your breathing when you're running up? Because I'll yes. tell you, the, when when I shoot a stage, after that buzzer goes off, I take a deep breath, and then I don't let it out until the unload and show clear. <laughs> or at least that's the way it feels sometimes. It's like, you know, after that uh, that seventh gong, I realize, like, oh, I haven't taken a breath in a while. My my uh, vision's starting to get cloudy around the edges here. That's correct. So, and you can you can do that for yourself in, in training and in practice. You Lay down behind a rifle, put some steel out at whatever distance, and hold your breath and shoot multiple shots and just keep watching through the scope. And eventually you'll start to see that cloudy yes. or that hazy yes. coming around. It's because your body's stealing oxygen from your eyes. Yeah. Right? I noticed that when I was in uh, Texas, I was shooting a local match, and they had um, a bunch of BC zone uh-huh. uh, steels that were out at, you know, 68 to 80 yards, something like that, on the back of the berm. And so it was, uh, there was no, there was nothing supplied. So it was an offhand shot. Mm-hmm. And I noticed, you know, about the, uh, about the sixth one that I hadn't taken a breath and that, uh, I was starting to, to lose yeah. my so, acuity, my skills. So I consciously, I, I don't consciously pay attention to my breathing necessarily when I'm running. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But what I will do, and, and what a lot of people will do, if, if you watch them just, just as they're getting to the barricade to shoot long-range rifle or as they're picking a gun up after they sprint to it, as they pick the gun up and mount it, you'll hear them take a couple of really deep, big breaths. Mm -hmm. It's to try to, to get everything and get oxygen back into your bloodstream before you pick the rifle up and, yeah. and, and start you know looking through the scope or even pistol, whatever, you know, just to, to get yourself right again. Um, and it does. It makes a big difference. Yeah, it does. And, and you'll notice, you know, at least I've noticed over the years, if you're trying to shoot offhand rifle, you know, if you're trying to hold your breath, what ends up happening is every time you shoot and you miss, it's like your body crumbles a little bit. Mm -hmm. You're getting your forms getting worse and yes. worse and worse and worse, and your vision's getting worse. And then people generally try to start shooting faster to make the problem better. Right. <laughs> um, but what you know, if I focus more on my form really than my breathing. Whenever I pick a rifle up to shoot offhand, you know, after I miss a shot, I make sure that I keep my shoulders up and square, mm -hmm. you know, my face, my cheek weld right on the rifle, um, rather than, than letting yourself slouch into that mm -hmm. into that bad form because you're doing nothing but, but you know, making your problem worse. Right. So, so if you have, like, a situation like that where, you know, it's a straight stand-up yeah. sort of thing and you're delivering um, just, say, 10 rifle shots, mm -hmm. um, you know, 60 yards, something like that. Offhand shots. Um, what's your breathing like? Is it just natural breathing, or are you doing the, um, you know, respiratory pause? Because at on, that point, depends on the size of the target. You're supposed to be shooting too fast to. Depends actually, on the size of the target. If okay. I'm shooting big gongs at 60 yards, I'm just doing natural breathing. I'm right. just I'm just breathing normal and, and going across targets. Now, if we're shooting a plate rack at 60 yards, yeah, you know, I try to do a, a pause. Um, generally, at the beginning of the plate rack, and then breathe again at the end, which isn't right. Right. But, right. But that's generally what how i do it. it like i said it depends on the size of the picture you know that's that's just like if you want to open up another can of worms the one i open both i yeah. open you know yeah i i, I believe in a hybrid of, of that as well whenever i'm shooting my pistol if a target is less than five yards away i have both eyes open yeah you know anything beyond five yards i close my left eye or at least start squinting it and yeah. then if it gets out beyond 10 or 15 yards, I shoot with my left eye completely closed. Yeah. I d I'm the same way. Um, uh, Brian Enos in his book, Beyond Practical Shooting, calls it, you know, seeing what you need to see or, Absolutely. you know, the acceptable side picture. Um, and I noticed when I was in Minnesota at Trigun, which is, um, you know, a match that we shot together, yeah. they put out a ton of, like, six-by-six six plates, and they love to put them, you know, near to far. Mm. And a lot of them out there. And the farther away they get, the smaller they are, mm -hmm. obviously. And so you have to uh, respect that shot a lot more. Yep. Um, and it slows down your, your match. And it, it makes you concentrate on aiming the farther they get out there. So that's, uh, that's something I noticed myself doing in that particular match is the close-up stuff. You know, I was just like you were saying, yep. two eyes open and... Seeing what I need to see. You know, in the beginning of the pistol shooting, for me, um, like I said, I was blessed to be in the Richmond area with, with a bunch of, you know, legendary pistol shooters, If, if absolutely. Um, and I asked Scott Warren one day, I said, so at, at what distance do you start aiming with your pistol? And you want to take a stab at what the answer was? Zero. At, at my muzzle. Yeah. Every shot I see a sight picture. Yeah. It may not be the same sight picture at two feet as it is at twenty yards, but my I see the you know, my fiber optic in the middle of the brown target at least. Mm -hmm. And I trust my index. And you trust your index out to the point where you can't trust your index anymore, then you start bringing a rear sight into it and it goes on and on. And I do the same thing with pistol classes that I do for people. You know, we we start off with um you know, moving the sights around, the front sight and around in the back notch, all the way to the left, all the way right, all the way up, all the way down, you know, at five yards. And then we right. do that again at 20 yards and show what the difference is and, and how much more important, you know, proper sight alignment is and sight picture is at 20 yards than what it is at five. Um, and it it really resonates with people. And that, that drill, if you've never done that before, um, take your pistol out. Set up a target at five yards. Mm -hmm. Drop your front sight all the way down to the bottom of the notch and shoot one shot. And bring it up, you know, the right elevation. Move it all the way over to the left. Shoot one shot. Move it all the way to the right. Shoot one shot. And then all the way up out of the back notch and shoot one shot. Then take that target or take yourself and, and make the distance 20 yards. Do the exact same thing. At five yards, you're still in an eight-inch circle. Right. You know, at 20 yards, you may or may not be on the target left or right. Yeah. And you, you're going to be all the way at the bottom of the target, maybe in the head at 20. 
Huh. So it, it really it really shows you the importance of sight picture and sight alignment between close and, and further distance. Mm-hmm. So then let's uh, let's talk about that uh, transition into three gun mm -hmm. more. Once you once you decided, okay, this is going to be the best bang for the buck, and I'm going to get good at this. What what w did you do? Any sort of like training? Did you do any sort of like uh, practice, or did you just show up at matches and and let the uh, lead fly? <laughs> so <laughs> funny story. I should have my wife tell it actually. <laughs> So after I, I started shooting three gun, right, I'm like, yes, I'm going to make this happen. I buy a shotgun and everybody's talking about loading a shotgun and they're saying you should be able to load at least one shell per second in a shotgun. Okay. So and this, get, again, is the shuffling underhand yeah, shuffling sort of thing. Yeah, shuffling underhand. For the people who haven't seen it, it you yeah. know, you've got caddies where they're stacked yep. side by side by side. You're pulling four out at a time and it's like shuffling a deck of cards out yeah, with one, one hand. One at a time into mm -hmm. the bottom of the gun. Yeah, it's it's a masochist thing. It's, yeah. it's terrible. <laughs> um, and I still to this day hate it. But um, so there's a you know, one shell per second. So I, I'm at home in my in my gun room and my wife's sitting over in the living room on, on the couch watching T V and there's shotgun shells flying everywhere. <laughs> And and I've got a timer and and I'm cussing and throwing shotgun shells and I told her I was like it's po it's not possible said, these people are crazy so you cannot it took me like nine seconds to load four shells it was hideous right so um, I literally practiced loading a shotgun in my gun room every day for probably thirty minutes a day uh -huh. until I got down to where I could load a shell per second you know and that was the one handed shuffling thing and then of course. You know, I've I've always been a fan of putting as many tools as possible in your toolbox, mm -hmm. right? So I was doing it support hand, and then I started working on strong hand, where I could load either hand. Oh, cool! You know, in about a shell per second, and then as soon as I got that all figured out, and I'm <laughs> like, it, I, I I can do this. I can I can at least hang. You know, I'm not the fastest in the world, but I, but I can hang. Then they come out with load twos, where you're right. just literally stabbing two shells into the shotgun like a Neanderthal, <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me! But no, that so for me, um, when I made the transition into three gun, I kind of rested back on my pistol skills. Um, you know, I, I leaned on them hard, mm -hmm. um, practiced loading the shotgun, um, and did dry fire with the rifle, just presentations, reloads. Um, getting into position, you know, practice going prone, practice kneeling off barricades and, and that kind of stuff for actual live fire. Um, but the most, for the most part, it was loading the shotgun. Mm -hmm. It was loading the shotgun and then figuring out. It was a huge part of the game. Stages. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the shotgun is, you know, they should have figured out a better third gun. Yeah. For the whole three gun concept, you know, it could have been a PCC. Yeah. Now you know, it could anyway. Or, or grenades. I don't yeah. know. Something other than a shotgun. But um, it seems like a lot of people don't like uh, shotgun. Yeah, and then you have the fanboys that they love shotgun. I know? love shotgun. Yeah. Well. It's it's great, man. It's fun to shoot, you know, scatter guns and watch clays burst. I um, love shooting them, loading them on the other. Yeah. Guns. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, and so that brings up an interesting point. You know, we go to a lot of these shotgun matches, and they'll have, like, a 50-round jungle run. Mm -hmm. Well, why why do we have that? You know, if the capacity of the shotgun is, say, 10 rounds, right, and you're from um, IDPA, where it's like a martial background, right? Mm -hmm. So if we if we look at this as a practical shooting sport with a martial background, and the shotgun is the only time you'll ever hear me say this, by the way, <laughs> is the if you look at it, like, you're going to shoot all the rounds in that and ditch it. You're mm -hmm. going to go to your pistol, you're going to go to your rifle or whatever, you know, in like a, uh, a martial situation. Right? Sure. So why do we not do that in three gun? Like there's an array of I like do every eight chance to ten I targets. Get. There's an array of eight to ten targets Every here. chance I get, I smoke throw them away. Em, <laughs> smoke them with your uh, shotgun and then go to your pistol, go to yeah. your rifle or something like that. Yeah. But it, it became a loading contest instead of a it shooting, uh, a shooting contest. shotgun contest. And that, I think, is what um, what makes some people shy away from it. But if, it, it, in all fairness, throughout the years of shooting shotgun, I, I give it a hard time, and, and I don't like the fact that it's a loading contest, not a shooting contest. Yeah. Um, but if you look at what the match director's requirements have forced people to do mm -hmm. and innovation for loading a shotgun. Yeah. I mean, if you would have told anybody in the world 10 years ago, Mm-hmm that you could shoot one load four and shoot one in two and a half seconds, they'd have told you you were out of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we got people blowing that away on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's it's really incredible what 
you know, the the people in the shooting sports, you know, can put their, you know, put their mind to and, and come up with innovative and, and different ways to do it and then practice in that skill set yeah. to, to mastery. Well, so I quad load, and yep. I don't think we've actually shot together on a squad, but I'm not the fastest quad loader in the world. Mm -hmm. But if you put me in front of someone who – is not a three gunner, mm -hmm. and you show them that mm -hmm. it's like I'm doing magic or something. Oh, yeah. You know, it's voodoo. It, it, yeah, it's voodoo. It's yeah. the most amazing thing they've ever seen. It's like bringing matches to uh, the the uh, natives. Yeah, you know? it, it's funny whenever you do, take that to a hunting camp. Oh yeah, take it to a hunting camp where everybody shoots. You know, two two weeks a year if they get lucky and see a deer to shoot at <laughs> or a, you know a <laughs> rabbit or whatever, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm a load shotgun. And they're like, w what just happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I don't mind shooting the shotgun, but if you go back to your mindset on the whole Marshall and just throwing the shotgun yeah. away, you know, I, I, my big thing is slugs in three guns. Yes. I get it in tactical shotgun. Yes. I get it. But why in the world would I ever throw a perfectly good rifle in a Rubbermaid garbage can and then pick up a shotgun and shoot a single projectile at a steel plate at 80 yards? Yes. It does not make any sense so, to me. So I'm, I'm of the exact <laughs> same opinion. And, again, this is the only – you know, area where I talk about this because I love to think about it as a game. Mm, oh, it's because it's it's a fun game. It's yeah. fun as shit. But oh, absolutely. But um, when when you think about it, like uh, the um, match directors that are like, okay, we're gonna put a a BC zone target out there, and we're gonna put that at 80 yards, and then uh, we're gonna put a full size Zipsic for you at 130 yards. Like the shotgun is the wrong tool for that <laughs> job. But no one puts, and uh, I need you to back me up on this one, Rob, because okay. this is fun as shit. No one puts like big. Uh, slug targets at like 40 yards. That would be so much fun. It's so much fun to yeah. go fast on slugs. Ka -ting, ka -ting, ka -ting. Like yeah. Last year at uh, Gen 3 Gun, they had, uh, I want to say there was like 43 or 45 yards, but there was uh, an array of five slug targets in a V, and they were on a raft. Nice. Right in the middle of the uh, pond. Yeah, exactly. And, but it was anchored down, so it didn't, yeah. didn't move too much. But holy crap, you could shoot those things yeah. fast because they're so so close, and the margin of error was uh, was so great. Close slugs are super fun. Yeah. We need to have more of this. They are. They are. Uh, you know, I, t I talk about Utah. I tell people about this all the time because it was a match that totally blew my mind. Like two years ago, it was a three-gun nation regional. And the furthest offhand rifle shot in the match was like 60 yards. Mm -hmm. We shot a 18 by 24-inch slug gong at 150 offhand with a slug. <laughs> And we shot a 10-inch round plate at, like, 75 with no a kidding. slug offhand. I'm like, there is something wrong with somebody's thought process here. You know, Why can't we shoot those with a rifle and shoot the close ones with a shot? Yeah, but, you know, I get it. The match directors throw it out there. Everybody has to do it. It's mm -hmm. to test skill sets that people don't think of on their own. Yes. Right? And, and that's what you're trying to figure out is who shoots the best right, right. who can solve the problem and, and not something that they practice in their backyard or at their home range yeah. week after week you know before that match nobody had ever shot at an 18 by 24 inch which by the way it was 18 inches high and 24 oh, inches nice. wide <laughs> at 150 <laughs> yards with a slug gun yeah. i mean at the end of the day most of the people that I know in Ohio and Indiana and places you have to hunt with slug guns, mm -hmm. they wouldn't shoot at a deer at 150 yards with a rifled slug gun and a scope, let alone yeah. a smooth bore with a foster slug, <laughs> a screw-in choke tube, <laughs> and whatever bumps you have on the top of it, right? <laughs> but, yeah, whatever. Well, so solving the problem. Yeah. You know, when you when you started working into, into three-gun and mm -hmm. stage breakdown becomes um, like a uh, – you know, maybe uh, a hindrance or something new that you have to do between three guns. Sure. How did you How did you work on your stage breakdown? Well, stage breakdown. Whenever I first started, um, you know, I shot through the evolution of stage design idealism. I guess mm -hmm. if, if you want to call it that, if that's the right word for it. When I first started, it was from here you shoot yes. target one through however many with your pistol. From here, you shoot target one through however many with your shotgun. From yeah. here, with your so everything and then they was throw very three boxes on the ground. Yeah, right? everything was very regimented, right? Mm -hmm. And and he, and then they went away from boxes and they and they said all of these targets have to be shot with this gun. All these targets have to be shot with that gun. So for me, the stage breakdown in three gun kind of progressed. I was there through the progression. So it wasn't like when I started it was like it is now in a lot of the the option matches mm -hmm. where. Paper you can shoot with pistol, rifle, or shotgun with slug. Steel yeah. can be shot with pistol or shotgun. Orange steel is designated rifle only, yeah. right? Because for somebody just starting into the game and they walk up to a, 
you know, a, a 60 round stage with those parameters. And now they've got to figure all that out. It's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but as we progressed, we kind of learned what was possible and what wasn't possible with a pistol, what was and wasn't possible with a shotgun. So as they opened those parameters up little by little, it was just a natural progression. So it felt normal Yeah. for us. Um, I will tell you that after shooting three gun for about a year, we went and shot a USPSA match, and it was one of the more difficult local matches um, historically. And they had a 32 round field course, and everybody's there scratching their head. And Ravin and I walked up to it and to walk the stage before the match. And we walked over, and I'm like, okay, so here I'm going to shoot this, this, this. I walk over here, I'm going to shoot that, 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 that. I'm going to walk over here, that, 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 that. I was like, okay, then I throw my pistol away, then what do I do? <laughs> And everybody there's like, what? I'm like, yeah, that's, that, and he's like, yeah, that's easy. And they're like, you guys used to, you know, like pawn over these stages for hours, you yeah. know, and, and, or pour over the stages for hours and, and try to figure these out. And I'm like, well, it's, it's only 16 targets, man. There's <laughs> only so many places you can shoot them from, right? But that also changes between USPSA oh, and, and three gun. That's uh, the attack of the leaf monster. <laughs> but, um, that also changes between USPSA and three gun too, yeah. because the things that really matter in USPSA don't matter as much in three gun. Right. You know, a tenth of a second here, a quarter of a second there on yeah. your draw or it's like your a half position. step. Yeah. yeah, a half step. You know, and that stuff really matters in USPSA. Yeah. It, it can be the difference between winning and losing. Mm -hmm. Whereas in three gun, you know, the the penalties are a lot higher. You know, you lose more time in gun transitions than you do in whether your foot was six inches too far to the left or yeah. not for a target presentation. So, Well, and that's one thing I really enjoy about 3-Gun. The, the reason that it appealed to me is that it w it's not so much of like a uh, a finesse and finely tuned and choreographed sport like USPSA is. There's a lot of pandemonium going on, but if you do your pandemonium faster, yep. then you're going to come out uh, near the top of the heap. Yeah, I, I love the freedom of 3-Gun. I, yeah. love, I love the matches where the match directors – throw out a problem and they give you very limited you know direction like we said paper targets are this 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 steel this you know go solve the problem yeah you know and, and that way it allows you to to lean on your strengths yeah you know uh we shot a slug target one year at tar heel um they had these gongs one at like 90 and one at 110 yards and they had said at the beginning that m most of the slug targets were slug or pistol you mm -hmm. can utilize them either or can we shoot that with our pistol? Or, you know, they're like, if you want to, go ahead. You know, and they're yeah. like, uh, watch this idiot try to shoot. You know, you shot him with a pistol because at the time, I couldn't hit a 110 yard slug gong with a slug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could hit it with a pistol. <laughs> so, you know, it, so it, it allows you to, to play to your strengths. Yeah. Right? Where there's other people that shoot shotgun all the time and not touch the pistol if they had the opportunity yeah. or the option. Yeah. Well, I found that in uh, my, my travels to Minnesota. There's a lot of guys that would choose shotgun in areas Absolutely. that I would definitely choose pistol. You know, And it goes back to where they came from, you know, in their, their shooting journey because the range that they were on, um, I can't remember the, the specifics of it. They got booted off. Yeah. And then they couldn't shoot rifles, and they could only shoot shotguns. So they shot tactical shotgun matches monthly. Like the people down where I, you know, where I started shooting, we, we shot pistol matches all the exactly. time. You couldn't find a shotgun match. Right. So for them, every weekend, they shot a tactical shotgun match. Yeah. So whenever somebody said, oh, you can do the same thing with a pistol, they're like, well, that's stupid. Why would I do that? I have a shotgun. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it, it's, it's all in what you practice and what you're comfortable with. Yeah. And you, you know what's cool is, is the like you were talking about the freedom. There's a couple of cool things I've seen over the last uh, couple of years here. One, um, uh, the first time I experienced it was in uh, um, Texas. We were in Mar Marble Falls for the, I believe they were calling it the Southwest Regional mm -hmm. at that time, uh, Three Gun Nation. Uh, Brian Corey put out a stage that was like a W, yep. and there was like uh, eight or nine uh, dump boxes. Maybe I'm exaggerating on that. Yeah. But it was uh, start anywhere with any gun. It, and, you know, there's this huge array, and that was the biggest problem to solve. Unfortunately, that one got rained out by the uh, yeah. the typhoon that came through, so we weren't able to shoot it. But then uh, The standard issue, three-gun nation, <laughs> regional <laughs> yeah. storm. But then fast forward to uh, um, last weekend at the Jeff Kirkwald Memorial match mm -hmm. in, uh, in Forest Lake, Minnesota. Uh, Adam Maxwell put down a bunch of stages that were uh, similar in spirit to that, start anywhere, and reactive steel uh, is pistol or shotgun. Pipes or shotgun, clays or shotgun, 
Uh, static steel is rifle, pistol, or shotgun. And then uh, paper is rifle, pistol, or shotgun. Mm-hmm. And that gives you so many different options in, sure. in how to shoot a stage. Like when you're sitting there looking at some, uh, you know, 50-yard uh, static steel, you're like, okay, well, that's a, you know, that's an easy rifle shot. It's not a bad slug shot. It's, you know, now i got to concentrate on pistol. It's like, what what is my strength here, you know, sort of question thing. question is, what's in your hand when it's there? Yeah, exactly. And then how is do you it mi- worth a gun transition? Is it worth a gun transition? How do you minimize those gun transitions? Oh. What's the next thing you have to shoot? What's the last thing you have to shoot? You know, that sort of thing. So it became, uh, you know, some, you walk up and you're like, well, is this a, a two-gun or a three-gun stage? That's the first thing you figure out. You know, am I, am I going to Do I have to shoot my shotgun? Do I have to shoot my shotgun? Do I have to shoot my pistol? You know, it, and, it, and in Minnesota, a lot of times it's do I have to shoot my pistol because right. that is, like you said, their uh, their heritage sure. strength is their shotgun. So sure. it's um, – I came in on the – I guess on the more options, the better mm-hmm. sort of thing because most of the, the major matches that I started shooting were in, uh, you know, 2016. Yep. So when I, when I see the regimented – from this box, you will shoot these four targets in this box yeah. from that – Nobody likes those stages anymore. I kind of feel like, uh, you know, time has passed those things by, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and the three-gun community, like them, love them, hate them, whatever, um, that they have, you know, Charles Soule and Rob Romero to thank for a lot yeah. of um, – for a lot of the things that we're talking about, the yes. choices and the options. You know, Rob Romero really – Charles started that um, at Tar Heel a little bit um, at, at the local matches. And then Rob Romero really blew that wide open with the Pro Series um, when we shot the Pro Series in Tulsa. Yeah. Um, which is – that's what I'll refer to as the Pro Series because it's, it's changed a lot. But that, in my mind, in most of the Pro Series shooters' minds, that was, you know, those two or two or three years that we shot there in Tulsa. Um, that was the Pro Series. Yeah, it was and like 2012, 13, or 14, right? Yeah, yeah. And they, they really blew that wide open with the options. And, and you know, everything was in pistol bays. So yep. your, your rifle was really nothing but a shoulder-mounted pistol at that right. point. You know, further shots, a 10-inch piece of steel at, at 50 yards. You know, it's um, – but those stages were so much fun. And so fast. You want to talk about a, a five stage drag race, man? Yeah. Every, every we did it five times a year, and you know, literally, I, I can't remember all of them, but the one that was one of the ones that was most mem- memorable. I think I finished 14th in the match, and I was four seconds from first. Oh wow! And I was like four <laughs> seconds separated first and 14th. That's crazy. And, and the stages weren't small. It was five big stages. You know, you would shoot. 400 rounds in five stages and everybody would be within Jesus. 10 seconds of each other you know it, it was it was crazy it was it was so much fun yeah um but that's where you you know all those options you, you play to your strengths you shoot the pistol mm-hmm. with the shotgun you shoot pistol with the pi- you know or pistol with the st- or steel with shotgun or steel with a pistol mm-hmm. you have to choose you know there's x amount of targets you have to shoot with a rifle you have to shoot with a shotgun everything else i got to figure out the best way to do it yeah the best way to solve that yep. problem yep so what kind of um, what kind of training did you do for that pro series? Like, obviously, you know, at the forefront of your mind that that is a, its own animal of a match. And every little bit counts for so much when you're talking about first and 14th being separated by four seconds. Like, how do you prepare for that type of situation? Shoot a lot of matches. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you have to know what you're capable of accuracy-wise with each each gun. You know, how far away can I make? Uh, make two accurate shots with a pistol on a piece of paper, you know, versus what my splits are on that same piece of paper with a rifle, mm-hmm. you know, number one. So you, you do a little bit of leg work on that end um, so that you know what the fastest way is to deal with each target array in a stage. Um, and then from that point on, really, uh, you, you drill, drill the crap out of gun transitions and shooting on the move. Because in those stages, if you didn't shoot 60 to 75% of the targets on the move, Mm -hmm. you were backing up. Yeah. You you couldn't win. I mean, you got Daniel out there who is, you know, the kid is amazing, you know, and and he's one of those guys, he's so good 
that you really don't want to like him, but he's <laughs> such a nice guy that you can't dislike him, you know? No, but Damn um, him. Yeah, but you, but you watch Daniel, you know, and he's running, you know, full out with this little bitty rifle and, you know, shooting steel on the move, running mm-hmm. wide out, and it's like, you know, how, how do you compete with that? And yeah. That, but Greg Jordan and Keith Garcia, I mean, those guys – I mean, they went toe to toe with Daniel in those, yeah. in those matches. And, and well, and if you look at like the uh, the 2012 season versus the 2014 season, yeah. if and if you really break down like what people are doing and 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 where they're um, making up time, there is way more movement in that 14 season than there is in 12. Absolutely, there is a lot more move post shoot, move post shoot yep. in 2012 versus 14. Right, it was a constant flow, and that. That, I think, is one of the, the cooler things, one of the bigger contributions that 3 Gun Nation has had to our sport. Well, and, and that's a bigger, the biggest contribution Daniel Horner had to the sport. Yeah, yeah. Because if you look at the 2012 season, the only person shooting all the targets on the move was Daniel. Yes. So what did that do? If you wanted to be close to or catch or beat Daniel, mm-hmm. you had to mimic what he was doing because everybody else was running post and shooting fast. Right. You know, and there's you can only run post and shoot so fast. Right. You know, and the, if the guy's running and shooting, it, it, you have to do that. So between 2012 and 2014, you saw more and more people taking more chances and shooting on the move more. Yeah. Um, and Daniel didn't shoot on the move any more in 2014 than he did in 2012. Just the rest of the field's catching up. The rest of the field was trying to catch up. And if you looked at 2014, there was a couple of times that Greg Jordan edged Daniel out in the matches. Yeah. You know, and, and how did he do it? Greg, I mean, don't get me wrong, Greg was a better shooter in 2014 than he was in 2012, obviously, because he's pushing every year and, and getting better and better. But at the same time, his biggest improvement was he was shooting on the move all the time like Daniel was. Right. So, yeah, I mean, with options, you know, it comes – great responsibility no. <laughs> but, with, with, with <laughs> but the but, serious look on your face on that one was perfect yeah but <laughs> but with options um you know it, it gives you places to gain advantages and it mm-hmm. gives you places to hang yourself yeah so um and, and you look at a stage like you talked about the w stage that brian Corey did in texas you know and you look at that and, and the amazing thing is if you take the top say 50 80 shooters in in the united states right and you had them all walk that stage separately individually by themselves Mm -hmm. right you look at it there's a thousand ways to shoot that if you take the top 50 have them walk it whenever they get completely done you sit down and compare notes there's maybe two or three different ways to shoot it Mm -hmm. that they're going to shoot it i mean there's a thing you're right there's a thousand ways to shoot it there's only two or three good ways to shoot it. Right. And those two or three good ways to shoot it will net out within a second or two of each other, depending on how you execute it. But the big differences between those two or three plans will be one person stronger with, you know, one group of people will be stronger pistol shooters. One group yeah. of people will be stronger shotgun shooters. One yeah. group of people want to shoot everything they can with a rifle or, you know. So it there's still a f- the, the efficient way to do it. You know, there's right. a thousand ways to do it, but there's only two or three right ways to do it yeah so this reminds me of the uh the diamond mine stage that we shot at the minnesota trigun okay when uh when i was walking through um originally like i had come up with like a, what i thought was a pretty good plan with some Which other one was the diamond mine it was the one with uh when it, where you start in the back with your rifle yep. okay i got you the one that was the diamond yeah it was shoot, literally yeah. Uh, yep. like a baseball diamond so yep. um for people that weren't at that match you start in the back with your rifle there's like uh, I think there was five stat four, four or five static uh, rifle shots that you yeah. had to make at um, certain distance, and then there was paper that were uh, pistol sh- uh, pistol rifle option. There were knockdown steels that were pistol shotgun option. Then right. there were some clays in there, so it forced you to use all three guns at different points, and uh, then there was a ton of options. Yep. Right. So the the plan that I had. I, th- I think when uh, when I showed you what my plan was, you referred to it as I, I look like a cracked out monkey running around the course. I, think <laughs> I don't believe said. I said that, but <laughs> maybe that's what I said. <laughs> but the uh, the top four to five dudes mm-hmm. uh, in that match probably had I think three different stage plans, mm-hmm. and that particular stage they ended up within like just a couple seconds yeah. of each other, and it was amazing to see like vastly different plans where you lean on a rifle, you lean on a pistol, or you yeah. lean on your shotgun, and then have them end up being that close. So when it comes to, to plans like that, number one, as long as your movement is efficient, right, as long as you're not doubling back further than what you need to, 
Mm -hmm. right or or you're not wasting time in in traveling Mm -hmm. right as long as you're shooting the whole time right or at least as much of the time as you possibly can um it's all execution right you know as long as you cut all of the non-shooting time off of the clock and you have the same amount of targets and you don't have a bunch of makeups right then you're really going to net out very close to each other depending on how you execute it. I got you. So that's the biggest thing. Uh, If you take any five shooters of a similar experience level, let's just say, right? You take those five shooters and you put 25 targets in front of them and tell them shoot these 25 targets and you have to do two gun transitions, Mm -hmm. right? And they're going to shoot those 25 targets with no movement. They're all going to be within a second or two of each other. Okay. Right? So the difference is in a stage, you have 25 targets and three guns. You have to do two gun transitions. Well, how efficiently do you get from one shot to the next? And how much time do you spend in between the gun going off? Yeah. Right? right. You you minimize that time. If you do all of that as fast as you humanly can, and then it's just, you know, because it takes everybody about the same amount of time to line the sights up and pull the trigger. Right. So it, you you have to figure out in your stage plan, at least for me, I figure out in my stage plan, how do I minimize the amount of time after the buzzer goes off between that time and the, and the last shot? Mm-hmm. How do I minimize the amount of time that a gun is not firing? Mm. Dude, <laughs> that's a great way to, uh, to attack a stage in a stage plan. So it, that's, for me, the, the non-shooting time is what kills you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that, especially on some of the uh, stages where, you know, you're required to move <laughs> move all the way to the right and all the way to the left or, you know, stop in the middle or something like that on some of these stages where, you know, there's walls mm-hmm. and, and targets hidden behind. And we, we kind of had some of these uh, – here at the Lucas Oil PCC match as well. Sure. There's, uh, you know, five ports. And for me, I try to, like, well, how can I minimize with maybe leaning or taking a partial target? How do I minimize how many ports I have to go to? And uh, some of these stages that Brian Corey has set up out here, mm-hmm. you have to go through all the ports. Yeah, you have to go through all the ports. Um, and in a, in a stage or match like this with stages this is set up this way, um, what I look for if I have to go to all the ports yeah. is I look for entry and exits to and from the ports. What can what what angle can I enter the port at that I can start shooting before I stop moving? All right. And which angle can I exit the port out of where I can start exiting before I'm done shooting? So okay. you're not running in, stopping, posting up, right. and shooting. You're coming in, you see a target, you bring the gun up. As you're settling into the port, you're shooting the first target or two. You shoot through it, and then as you turn and come out of the port, you're shooting the last couple targets. As you're backing up as out of the port. As you're backing up. Yeah. That way you don't, you're, not, you're not stuck with the start-stop time of right. your body before you're w- without shooting. Right. So, again, minimizing the amount of time between the time that the gun is going off. Right. Okay. Well, and so these, these stages are so stinking fast that – you know, it's the uh, a lean toward one side that's going to give you momentum into that next position is, yeah. is huge. Yeah. This is, like we talked earlier, between three gun and USPSA, you know, USPSA, a quarter second makes a huge difference yeah. here and there. That's what this match is. Yeah. This match is, if you don't land, if your foot doesn't land in the right place, yeah. if you don't start engaging a target as soon as you see it, if you go a half a step too far, you're getting a partial target instead of a full target. Right. You know, you have the jungle run over here, actually right behind us. You have the jungle run where, you know, I think five of the eight plates that I shot those little six-inch octagons, I only saw like half of the plate around the tree. Right. From, but if you stop in the exact right spot, you can shoot all of them from that spot. Mm-hmm. You don't have a whole target, but it saves you from moving again. Right. Well, it's, so um, earlier I mentioned, like, I don't think we've shot together, but now I remember we actually did in, in Texas this year at yep. the uh, Texas uh, Texas Regional at the Triple C. Yep. And that was my first uh, experience shooting a PCC in a match. Yes, it was. And this is... I think my third time shooting PCC, uh, second in a major match, and this, I would say, is the most pleasant time that I had. Oh, yeah. Because this is an all-PCC match. Yep. When when I've shot uh, before, I kind of felt like, uh, missed, like I missed out. 
you know, because like you, you guys were shooting all those, you know, far steel targets down at the uh, yeah, uh, Triple C Texas. comp or Cawthorn Cartridge Club. Sorry, I'm mixing up my my ranges. At the Cawthorn Cartridge Club, there's you know targets out to like 450 yards that you guys get to shoot, and I I'm like, oh, I gotta shoot that popper at 100 yards. I like to I like to hear you say you get to shoot the target at 450 yards. <laughs> 20, 25 mile an hour crosswinds and rain. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sounds awesome. <laughs> but yeah, but I guess I just missed the uh, the big boom of the the yeah. rifle and a three gun match. But this is a pretty cool environment too to shoot it in because everyone's shooting PCC. Sure, and I could see how that would be, you know, fun in like a, a local USPSA match as well. You know, um, shooting PCC instead of pistol. It's different. So, it's yeah. different. I've been shooting PCC um, in local matches now for about three or four months mm -hmm. um, getting ready for this match, obviously. Right. Um, and it's actually put the fun back into USPSA matches because it's, it's different. It's new, right. right. It's, it's, it's a different challenge, but it's easier, right. You know, but it's more difficult in other ways. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to go and shoot, you know, a quiet rifle. Yeah. That's not that expensive to shoot. Right? Yeah. It's nine millimeter. Um, you're only carrying one gun to the range again instead of, you know, six <laughs> or whatever you take to a three-gun match. Um, and uh, it's the same pistol stages but with a different gun. You right. Know, you, you can only shoot so many, you know, at least me. I, I have attention deficit disorder, but I, I can only shoot stages in the same bays so many times with a pistol before it's like, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, and and the same match director too, right? Because yeah. God bless him. Like you know, I'm only so creative. I can only yeah. think of so many different ways to to do something. And I know like a lot of people end up with that sort of thing as well. When you find a uh, you know a good match, and you're like, okay, well this this bay is the exact same stage that we shot six months two, ago. Six yeah. months ago, two bays down. Yeah, you know yeah. that sort of thing. But and, and, I'm, and I by no am by no way you know, taking anything from match directors. No, no, it's a difficult job. God knows I couldn't come up with stages. No. And I don't have the time in my life to put matches together and everything else. And Absolutely. You know, and and we, the sport wouldn't exist without those guys that are most of them volunteering their time to, you mm -hmm. know, away from their families and away from their shooting and everything else to put the matches together for us. But like you said, it, it becomes the same stage kind of just with walls in a different place right. or targets two feet further one way or the other. Right. But with the PCC, it's – it's a whole new dynamic because now, you know, what used to be just easy to lean around the wall with a pistol and, and shoot yeah. the target. Now with the PCC, it's it's a sporty shot or you have to switch shoulders or you have to do something. Yeah. You have to completely different stage plan. You know, I shot a match three weeks ago where you had to grab a, a T-handle with a rope or on a rope and pull it down to open a door and shoot like three targets through the door. Well. Easy with a pistol. I don't have three hands. <laughs> I don't did you have, use your teeth? No, I did not use my teeth. No, but you just grab it, and you pull it down, you just, you tuck the gun in your shoulder, you know, and you shoot a rifle one-handed, you know, right. and shoot the three targets and then let it down. But it it just poses new problems to solve, right. which is which is fun. Well, so you mentioned that you've been um, uh, working up toward this match here. Mm -hmm. This is this is a pretty big match. It's a pretty big deal. It's the inaugural yep. match. This is a brand new range that Lucas Oil. Uh, turned a uh, you know beautiful ranch with all these nice trees into a, a pretty nice range. Yeah, in like a month and a half. Like a month and a half. It's ridiculous. But it's crazy. Um, but we've known about it for several months, and so you've been uh, training in advance to to uh, shoot this match. Why 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 PCC this year for you? After all the years that you've been shooting pistol and three gun. So um, as you may know, actually you know more than anybody else right. probably. Um, I partnered up with uh, Therian Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, They're local. Um, to me where I live now. Actually, the, the our Therian Defensive Shop is right across the high school training field from my office for my day job. Oh, okay. Um, in Wisconsin? Yeah, in Wisconsin, right in Germantown. Um, and uh, I met up with Rick, who's the owner. I um, was looking at PCCs. I was al I've always been interested in it since it came about. Um, I went over and talked to him, and he really, um, you know, he's a former Marine, so he, he knows how to shoot, and he's a, he's a really great trap shooter. Um and he acquired this company um, at the beginning of the year, and uh, he really didn't know anything about the action shooting sports. He didn't know anything, you know, about what we do or that this even existed. Mm -hmm. um, so I started talking to him about uh, the pistol caliber carbines. I stopped over at the shop, took a look at what he had, took one of them out and shot it. Couldn't believe how well it shoots. Um, and I said, you know, we could we could build a, a competition model, 
and uh, you know we could do it really reasonably priced. Um, and the the thing that I liked about it more because I was looking at a JMR and I have a Tresna and, and uh, I have a couple other small pistol caliber carvings as well. But um, the one thing that I really liked about it is it's designed as a pistol caliber carving. Right. You know, it's not an AR that somebody's converted to nine millimeter. Right. And you know, I'm not putting any of those down because you know there's been a lot of technology evolution in in that platform, and and the guys that are shooting them are running great, but um you know you have to do a lot uh, uh, to to make them run reliable whereas this was designed for the nine millimeter cartridge or the 40 or the 45 or 10 millimeter mm-hmm. and uh so we put a longer handguard on it we put a comp on it you know we went through and i designed a, a oversized mag release and a charging handle for it it's a side charger uh we've since done a, a mag well for it and we've got a light and spring kit for the trigger and put mag pool furniture on it uh, or you know ctr stock and and pistol grip um and i uh, took the first one to the to the range and shot you know the first group i shot with at 100 yards with my regular three gun pistol hand load shot about an inch at 100 with a four power scope and i was like this this can't <laughs> can't be so I shot another group, and it was about three-quarters of an inch. And I was like, "This, it's got to be just this one gun. So we grabbed two more and shot them. And I have yet to shoot one that if you go through two or three different loads, I've yet to, to shoot one that won't shoot an inch and a half or better at 100. Huh. Um, so I told Rick about the the PCC match that was coming up and told him that we needed to be here. And uh, and voila, here we are. <laughs> so uh, I, took, uh, I took Rick to his first ever action shooting match it was a um, – an indoor USPSA match up in Appleton, Wisconsin, in like February or some miserable cold <laughs> month of the year. And only uh, things that happen in Wisconsin in February are indoors. Yes, except for us, that happens outside. <laughs> but um, so I took him. I took him to that, and that was his first ever action match of any type. And he shot three, I think, total outdoor local matches. And now he's down here shooting a match with us. And he got thrown on the super squad with us, and I nice. think his, his eyes have been huge all day. Oh, so that's, that's Rick that's shooting yeah, with you guys? Yeah, Rick oh, that's okay. shooting with us. Cool. He's, he's you have to introduce me. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, but uh, as you know, when we shot yeah, that match we, in Texas. Yeah, we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, we can talk about Let's it Let's talk now. about it now. So right. you, uh, you had had a PCC that was not working for you correctly, and I happened to have – I had the prototype – um, of our competition model down there. I know, there. Ki- Kismet, right? Like, uh, I think I think we met one more time um, before that, like at uh, Three Gun Nation Nationals, uh-huh. but only briefly when we were on the air with Tommy mm-hmm. um, doing the uh, the Three Gun yep. show live. Uh, and then we end up on a squad together, yep. right? So it's kind of like we're first, like, getting to know each other yep. and stuff. I have a, a, a borrowed PCC that went down because yep. I was shooting PCC division for the first time, and you're like, hey, I got this prototype. You can't tell anybody what it is. Yeah. Don't let anybody look at it. We actually took uh, uh, pasters the and pasters covered the and covered the name on them and stuff. Yeah. And and absolutely, because it, it, you know, it from a distance kind of looks like an AR, AR-ish, right? Ish. But then if you're standing within arm's reach of it, yeah. it does not look like an AR-15. Right. Other than the maybe the handguard, but it's yeah. a too thin of a handguard to be an AR-15. Yeah. yeah. So the the constant question I was getting was, what is that? And I would just look them right in the eye and say, I can't tell you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we wanted to make sure that it would work. <laughs> yeah. So you you were you took it on its maiden voyage. You're the first person to ever shoot one in a match. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so it uh, and it ran and it works. Yeah, it did. And, and it's it's been running here. We've got three of them. Ruben Alexson from Vortex is shooting one. He's shooting for the Thurian team now. Mm-hmm. Rick's shooting one. I'm shooting one. And uh, then my my wife told me yesterday that a guy stopped by the booth and said that he has one that he bought and and he's shooting it in the match. Also. Oh, how cool is that? So uh, so they're, they're starting to get out there. Uh, John Scouten saw it today uh, from Shooting USA and he, he said, "What is that thing?" And I explained it to him and then he he came over and looked at it and uh, hopefully it's going to be on on his show. Cool. You know, at some point this year. So um, we're hoping to get some traction with it and the price point's unbelievable. So it's yeah. tw- you know twelve hundred and forty nine bucks for the full-blown competition ready. You know, you can get a basic carbine for nine ninety nine. Oh, really? So, yeah, I can get the Dave Hartman discount for you, though. <laughs> if you really need a PCC instead of borrowing people's every every match. I know. I tell you what, man. Like, I had so much fun at this match that I'm, like, starting to get the itch. It's like, I need to get away from here, you know? You know how when you're, like, in the bar and you're like, one more beer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, we won't talk about what usually happens after one more beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, so so it's uh it's a pretty unique design. <clears throat> you know, um I took a bunch of pictures when uh um 
when uh, we had had the match, got some video and stuff like that. So I'll put that in the show notes. So if you're interested in checking this out, check out 3gunshow.com and look in the show notes, and we'll have uh, some stuff there. I'll have links to 3gun uh, defense. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool rifle. And it's uh, it's interesting, though, that it's a clean sheet design. Yeah. And when, uh, when you took it apart, I was just like, holy cow crap yeah. like <laughs> it tears down really quick and it easy tears down yeah. really quick and easy and uh it doesn't tear down the way you think it's going to come down either so it was uh and, and for reliability i mean it's it's a lot like a mac 10 receiver if if you really look at it but um as far as reliability goes my prototype that i've been shooting the actual one that you shot in texas mm-hmm. um oh is that the one you're shooting now mm-hmm. oh okay cool yeah it had uh has over 10,000 rounds through it. I cleaned it for the first time before I brought it to this match because this match matters, right? You're right. So, but I've been stress testing it and just shooting it as much as I can to see if we can make it fail. Um, I've had one malfunction with it in a small match, and it was a magazine issue. The mm-hmm. magazine was a salt shaker. You know, it wasn't the gun's fault. Um, but uh, but we're, we're really – really enjoying it and it's going to be a fun ride i think nice well, nice well rob you've got um you've got five stages down mm-hmm. five stages left to go mm-hmm. what are you going to be focusing on going into uh into tomorrow um so far i've shot a clean match um i gave up some time on stage nine uh that i'd desperately like to have back but <laughs> uh but it wasn't you know i didn't have a lot of pickups i just uh, i was just hunting and pecking for targets so um tomorrow my focus will be the same thing as today is just shoot a clean match um don't shoot the gun faster and i can see the t- see the site and mm-hmm. uh don't leave anything behind i mean the, the 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 one thing i will say about this match um the stages are very fast they're very close uh they beat people into going fast but it's time plus and not points right um and the penalties, yeah. the penalties, the penalties are, steep. are stiff they're steep they're five five seconds for a miss 10 seconds for nothing on a target and 15 seconds for failure to engage yeah in so a match like this where you know like our squad the majority of the stages today our squad everybody on the squad was within second and a half of each other yeah so well, you, you and throw when you mic, throw one mic yeah pff, match is over you're done so i i, I totally hosed up on i want to say it was stage four it was my last stage of the day, and, you know, it was like what we were talking about earlier, shooting those mm-hmm. 10 stages in one day. Last stage of the day, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going for broke on this one. And I went just Usually it breaks. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Success! <laughs> it yeah. broke. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I went just as uh, as fast as I could. And uh, I'm staring at, you know, when we unload and show clear, 18, you know, it was 18 seconds or something like that. And, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the fastest, wasn't the slowest on my squad. And I'm staring at a target with uh, Adam Weber of Weber Tactical, and he's the RO. And we're sitting there, and we're staring at this thing. And it's got – if you if you drew lines from all the points of those UML targets, mm-hmm. you would draw a line right through my one hole that I had on it, exact middle of this thing. It wasn't a partial target or anything. And I'm like, where is that other hole? And, there, and we looked and looked and inspected it, and finally I just go, shit. And he goes, one mic. You know, and that was an 18-second stage with a five-second penalty. Yeah. Like yeah. the penalties in this this match are huge. You know what they call targets like that in uh, in USPSA? One they, holer. They have a phrase for that. One holer. Well, they have a phrase for that. A perfect double is an alpha mic every time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's unfortunate. You know that. So they almost adopted three gun scoring mm-hmm. because yeah. in three gun that would have been good. That w- that would have been yeah. clean. Yeah, one absolutely. alpha or two mm-hmm. anywhere. Uh, but this is, has to be two somewhere, right? Yeah. So it's uh, I, I can't no, and, complain. And, and, and about, like it's yeah. it's not a surprise or anything. I read the rules like a week ago, yeah. and, and so I knew that coming in. But but um, it just goes to show like how important your hits are in in this game. One of the guys on our squad today had uh, sixteen second stage. I think it was. It had three mics. Oh wow! So it doubled his stage score. So, yeah, holy cow. Changes a 16-second stage to a 31-second stage. That's tough. That's smarts. Yeah. Uh, that that's hard to come back from. Yeah, yeah. So, And that's what I'm 10 seconds behind now. So Rick asked me from Therian, he says, so, so what do you have to do to win it? I said, I have to beat everybody tomorrow by two seconds on every stage. He's like, hmm. I said, yeah, ain't going to happen. <laughs> ah, you can do that. Nah. We'll just get you some good sleep tonight. and uh, Four monsters watch, in the morning. Exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll start shotgunning monsters on the first stage. All right, Rob, got a couple last questions for you. Yep. Um, one is what's some uh, what's like low-hanging fruit that you see three gunners doing wrong 
at maybe a new mid-level and uh, something that anyone can work on. Probably the number, there's two things I would say, two things. The number one thing is um, clearing their head. I mean, it's a mental game by far. It, it's, you know, I can't say everybody because there's, you have to be able to shoot a gun. You know, you have to be able to, right. to to effectively hit the targets at the distances that they are. That's a given. That has to happen. Um, but this game is 90% mental. Um, and I, I see people that will either show up at the at the stage um, the day of the match, look at the stage real quick and have no idea how they're going to shoot it, um, and then just attack the stage after the buzzer goes off. That, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. That, that doesn't work for anybody. Um, then I see the people that they come the day before and they overthink everything. They, yeah. You know, I, I come the day before and you walk through a stage and once you get a plan and you lock it down, you're done. You're, you're good. You write it down. You take pictures, video, whatever. Um, but they'll, they'll overthink and they'll have eight different plans in their head. Um, and then they decide one shooter before them <laughs> which plan they're going with. And, and that never works either. So, you know, and it's, so basically overthinking it. Uh, or not putting any mental preparative or preparedness into it right. um, at all um, is, is the number one. And the, and the second thing is, you know, if it's something that I've learned through all of the shooting from, you know, I, I haven't been shooting a, a long time. You know, you got people out here, Todd Jarrett's been doing this 35 years. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a freaking rookie compared to that guy. <laughs> you know, you got... Well, then you got me. Like, you, you know, I'm, I'm one of the more experienced dudes in in uh, my circle of friends outside of the Three Gun Show. But standing mm. next to you, I'm a rookie. Yeah, yeah. and you got Jerry Michalik, who yeah. everybody's a rookie. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, but but in in my experience, you know, as, as I've I've progressed through shooting, you know, you do this shit for fun. Have fun. You know, don't don't let your pressure to perform make it unfun. Mm-hmm. Because when you do, I think anybody out there that, that I know, that are close to me in my circle anyway, that I know, you shoot better when you're having fun. Yes. If you're just, you know, laughing and joking and, and cutting up with each other and, you know, and grab ass and then, you know, when you're in the hole, that's when you put your game face on, you yep. switch everything on. If you try to stay turned on, even like we were talking earlier, a whole day versus half day format, yeah. if you try to stay turned on for four to six hours mm -hmm. nonstop, and you're going to let every little thing that you did wrong in the last stage eat at you. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, that. You're just going to burn yourself you out. You burn yourself out, exactly. Yeah. It becomes unfun, and then you put more pr pressure on yourself to perform, and y it, it begins a downward spiral, right? Yeah. So, yeah, once you put more pressure on yourself to perform, like, okay, well, I need two seconds on each stage, so yeah. I'm going to, you know, exactly. juice it up here. Yeah, you can't, you know, Robbie Latham, um, you know, he says it. I've seen it in lots of videos from him, and I've heard it from him, and you know, in person and everything else. You know, one of the big mistakes everybody makes is, well, I lost five seconds on this stage, so now I've got to shoot the next stage five seconds faster. Right. You know, well, you were already planning to shoot that stage as fast as you can. Yep. If you try to shoot it faster, it's not going to end well for you. Right. So every stage, and then they go to the oh, I didn't pick, I didn't pick up the time on that one. I lost another second. Now I got to shoot six seconds faster on the next. Right. One. Now I got to shoot seven seconds faster on. So you're losing seconds on every stage rather than you know you just wipe it out of your mind. It's like I told uh, Ruben earlier today. He had an issue on one of the stages, and and he was you know beating himself up, which we all do. Yeah. And you know we were sitting in the van, and I said, hey, look, let's look at the clock. It's, you know, whatever, 48 right now. And that says, you know, colon five zero. It's time for you to quit feeling sorry for yourself and get ready for the next stage. Mm -hmm. You got two minutes. You got two minutes to beat yourself up. After that two minutes, you can't change it now. Yeah. You know, it, and you can't elevate your performance on the next stage to make up for the mistake you made on the last stage. Yeah. <laughs> because you were already planning to shoot the next stage as fast as you can. Right. right. So I, I guess that's... That's probably the best advice I could give anybody. You know, have fun with it. Make sure that you put the amount of mental preparation into the match that you need. Not too much, not too little. You'll figure that out, how, how much you need. Mm -hmm. um, pick a plan. Stick with it. 
don't change your plan. You know, last night I locked in stage 10. I walked it several times. Yeah. This is the way I'm going to shoot it. Mm -hmm. I came out this morning, talked to Matt. I said, what do you think? I think I'm going to change the plan. I'm going the other way. And it was. It was faster to go the other way. But I looked at it twice the other way and said, you know what? For the last eight hours in my mind, I've been yeah. going over doing it this way. I shot my plan. I was two seconds slower. But it, two seconds slower on a 52-round stage with five different shooting positions. And, you know, of the 51 rounds, I think eight of them were paper. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of steel, a yeah. lot of small steel. You know, position-sensitive stuff, you know, I lost two seconds. If I'd have went the other way and had a major catastrophe, I could have easily lost 10, 15 seconds or forgot a piece of steel, lost 10, 15 seconds in time and another 10 seconds in penalties. Yeah. So take what you got locked in and, and you run with it and execute it the best you can, and, and it will all turn out the way it's supposed to be, I guess, right? That's very zen. <laughs> <laughs> it Rob will be what it will be. <laughs> Rob, where do you see the uh, the sport of three-gun headed? I think three-gun will continue to grow. Um, I think we've seen a, a drop in sponsor participation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it has a lot to do with the dip in the gun industry. Everybody, you know, everybody likes to blame it on the election, and I don't think it – I think it does have something to do with it because the gun industry banks on the election, right? So right. everybody beefed up a bunch of inventory expecting one thing to happen and another thing happened and everything went flat on gun sales and, and stuff's dropping. Um, so they're not spending the money. Um, and, and I get it. It makes sense. It's a, it's a business decision for them. I mean, how many widgets can they can they give away to three gun shooters or make for three gun shooters? Right. Um, I think it'll continue to grow. I think you'll see a, a continued drop in uh, support uh, from the industry to an extent. Um, and I think the athleticism of the sport is is going to continue to rise. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at the guys now. I mean, a lot of the guys that were shooting have become CrossFit fanatics, and some of them are crossing over and and yeah. just CrossFit and and not shooting as much, and you got a bunch of people from CrossFit, you know, coming over to to three gun, um, and, and the physical ability of some of these guys now, like we mentioned earlier, is just unbelievable. They're they're so fast, mm -hmm. um, and they're yeah, fast twitch muscle reflex or whatever is is just unbelievable. Um, so I think the sport's going to continue to get faster. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with three gun nation. Um, I can't say a whole lot of my personal, my personal feelings on it. Cause I don't, you know, I don't want to start anything, but, um, I don't know how, how much longer it, it's going to be what it is now. I mean, they already announced last year that this is the last year for pro series right. as it is. Um, so I, I guess it continues as regional. I don't know what they've got in the pike for any changes moving forward. Um, I can guarantee you one thing. Lucas Oil didn't build this facility for just one match a year. No. So uh, I was talking to Junior here yesterday who helped Lisa Marie build the build the, the range, and he he's asking all kinds of questions about what they need for three-gun stages and, and bays and, and that kind of stuff. So um, I think if Lucas gets involved in it and they start a series, uh, there's rumors rumbling that there's another governing body that's that's going to try to rise up. Um, yeah, there's UML already, right? You yeah, the multi gun league. Yeah, you know, uh, we're using their targets here. Yeah, yeah, that's Pete Renzing yep. out of out of Vegas. Yeah, so um, I think where three gun was was really big on the East Coast um, and kind of budding, if you will, in the Southwest. I think you're going to see a lot more evolution in the Southwest, and things are starting to to you know, dry up a little bit on the East Coast. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I hope it continues. I, I think it's a great it's a great sport. It's a great community. Um, and it's it's a ton of fun. So I, I, I hope it continues. I hope they can find a way to rekindle some of the some of the support from the industry that, that have that they have lost. And don't get me wrong, there's some companies out there that are still, you know, supporting strong. You know, oh yeah. The, you know, Vortex and Benelli and um, JP and you know Bushmaster still supporting our team, our, our three gun team. Um, you know, so there's there's still some some big vendor support out there, um, but it's not like it was five years ago. Sure, yeah, it's so. not like you can come in like 25th and 
walk home with a rifle, right? Right, right. The, the days of super deep prize tables are, yeah. are went the way of the dodo. But um, hey, you just got to get better. And I think, well, <laughs> and, and I think PCC, um, PCC may be something. You know, Adam Maxwell opened the Kirkwald matchup, which I, yeah. it killed me that I couldn't be there. My brother, my, my baby brother is getting married, and he had a, a pre-wedding thing last weekend that we had to go to, so I couldn't make the match. Do but. two things. One, it wasn't actually the wedding. And second, you always want to make the appearance at the second wedding. Well, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. There was a family <laughs> member of mine that I missed their first wedding, and I told oh. my mom, who was very upset about it, that I would be at the next one. And I was dubbed not a nice person. But... <laughs> But I made good because when oh. they got married the second time, I was there. Did mom apologize? No. Of course no, she not. She was still unhappy. She's still right. Yeah, she. Yeah, I'm sure. Mom's always right. Yeah, well. So, um, but Adam opened it up last week to four gun. Yeah, which is cool. So the un- the open or unlimited division, you can be a four gun. So you can use your PCC anywhere you would use your shotgun or pistol. And I will make a prediction. I will make a prediction that with the death of the Pro Series as it is today, mm-hmm. that you will see more involvement uh, or more participation in open yeah. and limited. Um, and even heavy, I bet. And heavy. Yeah. Because the um, the actual Pro Series, I believe, effectively demolished the open and the limited ranks not so yeah. not as much the limited as the open yeah because we were forced to shoot tac optics gear right so you take the top 50 shooters or however many they had 50 60 whatever it was shooters and in, in the country and tell them you have to shoot five matches of year a year with tac optics gear oh and by the way the winner of that points raise or the top 30 of that points raise goes to shoot off for fifty thousand dollars right. in cash um and, and then you you look at all the people with the exception of jerry it was shooting open. Yeah. They're like, so I'm going to shoot my open gear all year, and then i got to switch to the other gear to shoot these five matches, and these five matches have 50 grand on the line, and the rest of the year has whatever that prize table has to mm-hmm. offer, right? So a lot of those guys put all their open gear down and went and started shooting. Makes sense, right? Yeah. So I think – But I, you're seeing a lot of the uh, – you're seeing a – I'm seeing a lot of people moving into limited – to kind yeah. of create some sort of like uh, you know shark tank there, mm-hmm. um, we've got Josh Freilich who, you know, hashtag only, only shoots only, open, only shoot open uh, except, except for today, here. <laughs> except here. Yeah, he, I only shoot open unless there's money at a match that doesn't ha- offer open. Then I'll shoot that one. Letting his fans down. Oh my God, oh, what a tragedy! Sad. Uh, never get too close to your heroes, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wow, somehow Josh just became my hero. <laughs> In general, the general year. Um, so we, so we've got you know Josh that's, yeah. that's shooting open and and now you know I'm I'm assuming like the the buzz that he's making around that is going to bring other people into that fold as well. We've got Dissident Arms that's making you yeah. know good open shotguns. Yeah. Yep. So it takes a it takes away some of the mystery of that as you well. Yeah. White side shooting open. Uh, yeah. Joel Turner shooting open this yeah. year from AMU. I uh, did a little bit last year too. Um, Jerry's obviously still shooting open. Mm-hmm. You've got uh, Travis and Wyatt Gibson. Yeah, um, Wyatt. still, Wyatt's an, an animal, man. I'm telling you. The, Young the, dude shooting open. The future of um, of three gun with the the juniors that we have now that are you know on the cusp. Of, I guess neither one of them are junior, but you got yeah. Tim Yackley. You've mm-hmm. got you know Brian Nelson. You got. Uh, Wyatt Gibson, these younger kids, Ashley Rourke. Yep. Holy cow! I mean, they, they, the way that these kids are shooting, it's unbelievable. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think open. Staskowitz, another one. Yes, yeah, Nate Staskowitz, exactly. You know, I think the way that uh, that the opens open starting to roll again a little bit, um, and the big thing is the cost of entry to open isn't as bad as it used to be either. Yeah. You know, when you got it's people, true. Jerry's running basically a carry optics gun with his M&P. He's running a slide ride dot. Yep. You know, a razor, I believe, is what he's running, a little razor dot on a slide of an mm-hmm. M&P Pro. Um, it's a ported barrel, but um, he's running that with a stick, a tube-fed shotgun yep. loading with sticks and, and a one-to-six razor with a with a 45-degree offset. You know, yep. that, that's, that's not really any more expensive than anybody else. It's actually probably less expensive. Than the majority of the tac ops gear that's out there, because you can buy an M&P for 
six hundred bucks, put a four hundred dot on it, four hundred dollar dot on it. Right. You got a thousand dollars in it. Name somebody that's shooting a twenty eleven in tack ops that got less than twelve hundred bucks in. Yeah, and, and then you're talking about um, now you've got a nice little carry optics rig that you can go yeah. practice in USPSA as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that one's going to, I think heavy's going to be the one that's going to be hard to come back because of the price of ammo. Yeah. You know, 308 not cheap. No. Nah. So. No, nah, that's true. All right, Rob. Well, we've, uh, we've covered a lot here. Um, let's, uh, let's give the audience one final thought or one piece of advice. What do you, what do you got? Shoot fast. Don't miss. All right. I like it. Rob, man, this has been a lot of fun, dude. The, uh, yeah, the times that we've shot together, the times we've hung out together at uh, matches, I've really enjoyed. And uh, I'm so happy to finally have you on the, the uh, show here. It's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be part of the Three Gun Show. Hey, before you take off, check out the show notes at threegunshow.com slash episode 151 for links to things that we discussed in the podcast, including pictures and video of Rob's Thurian rifle in action. You can also sign up on Patreon as a Three Gun Show supporter or purchase your very own Three Gun Show logo tee. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Armalite. Armalite has allowed me to get special pricing for listeners on their line of Three Gun Rifles, both the 13.5 and the 18-inch, as well as their competition handguards, gas blocks, and tunable muzzle brakes. If you're in the market for a rifle or components to build your own, email me, dave at threegunshow.com, and uh, I'll hook you up with special listener pricing just for you because you're awesome i'm back on the road now and i'm uh traveling the country and bringing the good times back to you in podcast form i will have all this armor light gear with me at matches for you to check out so when you see me at a match just ask and i'll be happy to show you and uh you can even shoot mine if you like a quick reminder that if you enjoyed this podcast subscribe in itunes google play podcast addict or wherever you get your podcast content so you will always get the very latest Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, and I'll see you on the range. If you are finished, unload show clear.